Former President Rodrigo Duterte was famous for a lot of ambitious agendas. Some have transformed the entire Philippines, some have caused international criticisms, and some are still ongoing. However, one of the largest and probably the most applauded agendas to his entire six-year tenure was a program called Build, Build, Build. It was a 180 billion US dollars initiative that he had set out to reconstruct the entire country and form many mega infrastructure projects. They were renowned for finally setting foot in the term golden age of infrastructures. Although much of what the media has shed light on his administration was that out of the 100 or so massive plans that he had introduced at the start and during his presidency was that some have never actually been greenlighted. According to the National Economic Development Agency of the country, only 18 of the 112 big ticket projects would actually only be completed during his six year tenure. Simply, a lot of the promised targets that his administration wanted to bring either never came into being or faced massive delays. So was Duterte nomics, build, 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 or his entire planning for infrastructure is a failure? Well, most of what people do not actually realize is how the government functions. You see, the infrastructure plans of President Duterte were reliant on three important factors, the government budget, foreign loans, and the public-private partnership framework. These three important factors are the largest at play in how the government will act on its targets. First of all, we have what we know as the government budget. This is basically the annual spending of the government after they receive the money from government revenues, which are known as tax and non-tax revenues. However, one of the peculiar aspects of this is that it's also the most important of the three. The government budget, after all, is the largest treasury that the government can use for its operations. But here's the thing about what everyone is missing out on. The government actually fulfilled its side of the promise. Even though only 18 or so out of the 112 big tickets were finished during his six-year tenure, the entire infrastructure spending of the Philippines substantially increased. This is very important because in the past 30 years, the infrastructure spending to GDP, meaning how much money they spend relative to the country's annual economic output, has never reached 5%. In fact, in the past administration, only 2.9% on average was spent on infrastructure. Yet by the time Duterte's administration arrived, the infrastructure spending went from more than 5%, with the latest reading on 2019 to 2021, seeing a 5.4% spending to GDP in 2019, 4.8% in 2020, and 5.8% in 2021. Hence, even though many can claim that his promised projects were a failure, what matters most is the government's spending, because at the end of the day, the only way for the government to construct infrastructure is either through its bulk load of annual income, partner with a private corporation, or borrow money. And we often forget about the other matter that this infrastructure spending has enabled. For instance, because of this heightened spending, in 2021 alone, we've seen the accomplishment of nearly 30,000 kilometers of roads, 5,950 bridges, 11,340 flood control projects, 222 evacuation centers, 150,000 classrooms, and so much more. Without properly sourced infrastructure money, most of these, if ever, would not even come into being. Now before we get into the next two concepts, we must first address government spending. You see, one of the most important factors why previous sitting governments did not spend as much as Duterte is not because they were incompetent. Rather, it was because they had different agendas. This is where everybody gets it wrong. For instance, when Duterte increased the infrastructure spending to 5% from around 2% previously, it also meant that Duterte would lower the spending to GDP in some other key areas. For example, the president would lower spending on healthcare, education, or whatever other sectors there are to pave the way for his entire plan. This is where government spending efficiency comes into play. What people should look out for is not whether a government can construct a particular project, but rather whether it's really the best option for the country. Is spending on a bridge better than spending on education? We will not delve into the matter of whether one is better than the other, but this is the most important factor to understand, is that a government's failure to provide infrastructure does not mean it failed entirely, it just meant it prioritized something else. The second concept of his infrastructure plan is the public-private partnership framework. This is known simply as when the government and a private corporation go hand in hand, mostly in a joint venture to build a project. This can allow the government to either jointly spend on the budget or even rely upon most of the budget to a private corporation. This framework is in fact one of the key priorities for the Duterte administration. When he initially announced his economic plan, he outlined the use of this PPP framework to construct many infrastructure projects. However, this is also where things had gone astray. While the PPP framework has enabled some infrastructures to be built, and some that are currently ongoing, most of them are still in the pipeline. 
For instance, according to the PPP publicly listed website of the government, over 49 projects are either still awaiting government approval, under conceptualization, undergoing review, or undergoing studies, and are still waiting for the government to initiate them. This might be because of the fact that a PPP framework is not always easy to do. After all, these initiatives are the ones that can be connected with political corruption. One can simply pay down a government official to favor them by giving them the bid to construct this project and earn all the hefty money in the end. Secondly, it is also difficult to ask private corporations to source billions of dollars of money to construct a project. Not every project, after all, is a promised deal that can generate sufficient money. Nevertheless, the entire agenda of the PPPP framework is a difficult endeavor, but it has still enabled many projects to be built throughout its lifetime. There are currently 14 projects that are undergoing construction or pre-construction at this moment. The last factor is loans. Borrowing money has probably been the most scrutinized aspect of all the government's plans. If we go back to our initial factor, we stated that there's a limit to how much the government can truly spend on behalf of their own budget, and hence they would need to turn to other sources of money. This important factor is through the borrowing of foreign loans. There are many fallacies, however, under this concept. First of all, a lot of projects that were supposed to be built through foreign loans did not happen. For example, one of the administration's largest partners was China, and the world's second largest economy had promised billions of dollars worth of infrastructure projects for the country. Yet unlike what most people thought, China had actually not fulfilled the $24 billion of projects they had promised, and even the few ones that had actually come to fruition were faced with massive delays. However, this is also where most of society's attention had been foregone. People often look towards China and its part in financing Duterte's ambitious goals, to the point that we forget that Japan is actually the largest partner in all of these. Unlike China, Japan has actually stayed true to most of its promises. According to a report published by Fitch Solutions, Japanese financing actually accounted for 29% of all the total foreign sourced loans. Data from the Central Bank of the Philippines also shows that external debt owed to Japan for both private and public sectors amounted to over $13.7 billion, whereas China at only $2.3 billion. This simply means that while society tends to look towards the failure of unfulfilled promises from China, they also forget about the country's long-lasting partner that outshines everybody, Japan. This report, of course, may still have missed a lot of aspects of Duterte's ambitious plans. However, what we will conclude for now is that the bag of how the plan was conceptualized was both a success and a failure. The government did successfully increase the infrastructure spending of the country to over 5%. This was the most important factor since it was the easiest way for Duterte to procure many infrastructure projects. However, we also saw that unlike what the administration had initially thought, the private corporation and foreign loans, especially from China, were limited. Had the private corporations taken on more projects, or there was a limited type of political instability, a lot more projects would actually have been built. For instance, Duterte had once halted many proposals from the private corporations themselves to build reclamation plans in the country. For what reason? corruption activities. Secondly, China's 24 billion promise was also a failure. Had the Asian giant actually fulfilled its promise towards the country, a lot of projects would already have either been built now or neared their completion. Finally, it's difficult to conclude whether it was a failure or a success, since we also missed out on one large factor in all of these. Projects, especially mega projects, are often struck with delays, and we only took into account the six-year tenure from 2016 to 2022 without regard to the impacts of infrastructures in the coming decade. After all, infrastructure spending is expected to continue even after Duterte's tenure is ended, which simply means that we're only looking at the landscape of today, yet forget about the impacts of all these in the future. Furthermore, China's role is also expected to grow in the coming years, and is it also due to the policies followed by Duterte? We believe so, since he had a six-year-long tenure that often embarked on many relationship building towards China. This is why the report published by Fitch Solutions has indicated that China's source of loans would gradually increase. The report also indicated that it was in part due to the warming of ties between the two countries, due to the Duterte administration. But anyway, as noted, this is just one side of an opinion. Do let us know what you think. Thanks for watching.